it's that, that way God does things, that if we're willing to invest in the life of somebody else, if we're willing to support them, to see their needs and to try to meet them, He brings it full circle and offers such a joy that's hard for us to explain. O oh Lord God, we give thanks for the beauty of this holy place, sustaining us through the years with scripture, preaching, music, and prayer. Help us to draw closer to you this day and grant us a lively faith and courage to do the work you set before us. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Please join me in the call to worship. Out of the depths of our struggles, we cry to you, Lord. Come, Lord God, and renew us. Out of the depths of our sins and failures, we cry to you, Lord. Come, Lord God, and redeem us. Out of the depths of our pains and hurts, we cry to you, Lord. Come, Lord God, and forgive us. We have come to give God thanks and praise. Let us worship the Lord. Please join me in the prayer of preparation and confession. Almighty and merciful God, it is a gift that we can come before you to confess our sins. You have already given us so much, and yet we continue to want more. We want everything to come without struggle, and we get so consumed with our own desires that our eyes are blind to people in real need. Forgive us when we fail to appreciate what we have, Lord. Forgive us when we don't do the work we need to do with care and diligence. Cleanse us of envy, greed, and laziness. Help us see the world with your eyes so that we will respond as you would with generous hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Friends, with joy I declare to you that in Jesus Christ, God has forgiven you, God has loved you, loves you now, and will love you always. 
This is the good news that brings us new life. Believe it, pass it on, and be at peace. Amen. As part of today's worship service, we'll be celebrating the Lord's Supper, communion, after the sermon is completed. So if you haven't done so already, I invite you to go and grab a piece of bread and some wine or uh, grape juice or some other kind of liquid so that you'll be prepared for when we are celebrating uh, the Lord's Supper. I also want to invite you as you go through your week after being fed here by word and sacrament that you will be in touch if you need any care, if you need any help, if you need me in any way as a pastor, I am here for you. If you want to contact me, please just do so with uh, my phone number and my address on uh, email or on the screen. I invite you to be in touch. in the Lord, wait patiently for him, and he shall give thee thy heart's desires. Oh, rest in the Lord, wait patiently for him, and he shall give thee heart's desires, and he shall give thee thy heart's desires. Commit thy way unto him, and trust in him. Commit thy way unto him, and trust in him. And fret not thyself because of evil doers. O oh, rest in the Lord, wait patiently for him. Wait patiently for him. O oh, rest in the Lord, wait patiently and he shall give thee thy heart's desires, and he shall give thee thy heart's desires, and he shall give thee thy heart's desires. O oh, rest in the Well, today we're wrapping up our series in the book of Philippians. We've entitled it Finding Joy in the Dark Places. And we've learned a lot about Paul and the dark places that he found himself in, the struggles and victories and things. And even though this is the end, the last message in that series, I think it would be good to go back to the beginning a little bit just to kind of set the stage for the way that Paul closes out his letter to the Philippians. Philippi, the city that uh, the Philippians and the Philippian church are founded in, is on the road, the main thoroughfare, if you will, that leads from Rome into Macedonia and on further east. So it was a critical uh, city for mining and trade and things. And on uh, Paul's second missionary journey, he came to Philippi and he founded and started the church there. Uh, in the book of Acts, it tells a little bit more about his time, early time spent there, and talks about uh, the very first convert to the church was a lady named Lydia. Uh, and there was a famous story about a, uh, a guard at a prison uh, that Paul found himself in, and 
he actually became a believer in Jesus because of the compassion that Paul showed towards him. So that was the, the start and the inception of the church in Philippi. And as that church grew and grew, uh, Paul was such a major player and figure in their lives and in the life of the church, a very, very strong bond was formed between Paul and the members of the church. Um, when he penned this letter to the Philippians, um, he was writing from jail. So he, uh, that was a source of a lot of um, urgency and he actually says several times in the book of Philippians how he feared that he was close to death, that he was in danger of losing his life really at any moment. Um, so it was the support and the bond that he had with the church at Philippi and the Philippians was a major source of resource for him, a source of strength and comfort, um, even in the, the times that he find himself in. And the letter that he writes to the Philippians it's very much like a letter that a soldier would write when he's going into battle soon, and he really fears that he may not return from battle, that he would be killed. So the, the tone of the whole book has a, a lot of urgency. There's no fluff. He gets right to the point, reminds them of the things that he wants them to know, and he refers to the bond between he and them frequently. Um, and it really is a story uh, of gratitude from Paul for the support and investment that the people at the Church of Philippi have invested in him. You know, we all have times, dark times in our lives, that we need support of other people to make it through. And the story of Philippians is very much like that. I had a time in my own life that was really a dark time for me. It had to do with the time that my father passed away. It's been 20 plus years now. But... Um, his memorial service, um, I performed it. And I wanted to do it, but I was scared to death to do it because it you know, was a hard emotional time. And um, even though we were trying to have it be a celebration of my dad's life, we, uh, we lived in New York at the time and my parents lived in Williamsburg, but my dad is buried in Arlington Cemetery in Washington, DC. Uh, and so that's where we had the service. So it was a bit of a no man's land and that didn't help my anxiety, um, and just the toughness of having to do that service. And I can remember sitting up on the chancel of the church where we were for the service, um, and really not even knowing if I was gonna be able to get up and say anything. And as the service started and some music played and somebody else was at the pulpit and um, just opening the whole service, I saw in the back of the church, the doors open, and in walked three of my best friends that lived in New York with me. And I can't tell you how much that meant to me, that they cared enough about me and knew the tough times that I was in, that they wanted to come and support me and invest in me at that point. And that alone gave me the, the energy and the uh, courage to get up and say the things I did about my father at his memorial. And it always something that has stuck with me and reminded me as an incredible example of the opportunity we have as people to invest in the lives of other people and how much they need that from us. But at the same time, God in his wisdom uses those circumstances that if we really do invest in other people, like those guys came down and invested in me. And just like the church at Philippi invested greatly in Paul's life, God brings joy on both sides of that coin through that experience of supporting and investing and pouring our lives into one another. The passage that closes out the book of Philippians, um, I'll read to you now. And it really starts with Paul just giving thanks to the Philippians for the support that they've shown him over the years. It's from Philippians chapter four, verses 14 to 23. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desired your gifts, that I, what I desire more is to, would be credited to your account. 
I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied, and now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts that you sent, they are a fragrant offering and an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all of your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. And then he encourages them by saying, Greet all God's people in Christ Jesus. The brothers and the sisters who are with me and sent greetings. All of God's people here send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Well, as many of you know, our church supports several missionaries. Um, one of those being uh, Martha Summers. She is a physician in the country of Malawi, um, and I've known her for many years. She's been here at the church and spoken. Um, but usually I would connect with Martha when I would take students to Malawi on our trips to hook up with our sister church of Kafita and do other mission work there. And I remember having a conversation with her a couple times about the struggles and ending up being joys and just the it's, it's weary, it makes you weary to have to rely on other people for your support and for your livelihood. And it's exactly what Paul, the life that Paul lived. Um, Martha's not available to talk to us, to so give us a perspective about that. So I took a few minutes this afternoon and had a conversation with a good friend of mine, John Wilson. Well, I'd like to introduce to a good friend of mine, John Wilson. Um, Thanks for being with us, John. Yeah, well, again, I'm John Wilson. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Amore Ministries. I know the Piedmont Community Church is pretty familiar with our outfit, having come down on trips with Amore for so many years. Uh, this last year, we really missed seeing the small city that is the Piedmont Group show up, put up, a, put up a bunch of tents, and spend a wonderful week working with you, getting to know your amazing students and, and the outreach you have there. And um, but yeah, so Amore for you know 40 years, 41 years now officially, uh, has uh, been dedicated to working alongside pastors in communities, uh, mostly in Mexico, but now kind of around the world and providing resources for families in need. And what that looks like for a lot of groups is coming alongside those families and building homes. And I've, I've for 19 years been a part of that in one capacity or another. Well, thanks for that. And uh, we thoroughly enjoy our trip every year when we can go uh, to partner with you guys. So I understand from just knowing you that part of your income um, you have to raise support. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit what that's like. Um, you know, the ups, the downs, the joys, the struggles of having to rely on the support of others investing in you uh, for you to have income. Yeah, um, I mean, the concept itself is even just daunting to think about still after, you know, more than 20 years of doing it in some capacity or another. Um, it's it's a weird concept it's not how I mean, we're wired especially as, as sort of americans um it, to to think about our income um but what what essentially it is is uh there are a group of people or a group of churches in my case both who find so much value in the work that i get to do with them more um the ministry that i do alongside churches like piedmont um, that they want to be a part of it themselves and, and the way that they they get to be a part of that is by supporting me or supporting members of my team uh, in the work that we do. Um, now the ups and downs can be many different organizations really manage these things differently but um, you know there are times when the support is coming in and the income is good. There are times when the support is coming in and the income is bad. Um, so there's a lot of discipline that goes into missionaries working, um, to make sure that we have something that balances that. Um, I'm fortunate in, in working with Amore in that our organization also is really dedicated to keeping talented people in the ministry. Not everybody comes from a, a rich church history or from a, a place where there are a lot of resources behind them. So how do we as an organization um, keep those people engaged in the work if they don't have the background that some others do in being able to raise a lot of support? So. Our organization actually raises money on behalf of our team members in addition to what they can raise. And so we have people who donate to individuals um, for their salary, but we also have people who donate to this, what we call the salary pool, which goes to help the, the whole team. When, when I talk about the benefits of it, 
um, really what what is so remarkable to me is that there every time I act on behalf of the ministry, every time I step into um, the kind of the organizational shoes, I know that I'm carrying the blessing and the prayers um, and the cheering on the the positive energy of all of those people, all of those churches who support me and support our organization going forward. Um, within that is is a lot of uh, uh, responsibility as well, because they also keep me accountable to the calling that we have as an organization and, and the calling that I have as somebody who wants to share in that ministry. So yeah, it's both sides of that. It's it's the accountability, the responsibility. Um, you know, as uh, you know, it says in the Bible, like in some sense, uh, there's a great cloud of witnesses that are there with me, um, along alongside me, doing what I do, even if they're in the background supporting. As with most things that God ordains, um, He finds a way to bring out joy, both in the the gift and the giver, um, the person that receives it and those that support. Well, buddy, it's, it's always good to see you, and I appreciate you spending a few minutes with us. And uh, I know you had to cross the border to get back home to do this today. So thanks for fitting it in your schedule, and I look forward to seeing you soon, hopefully next spring. Take care, yes. Don. Love you all. Miss you all. We'll see you soon. Well, it was always good to, to talk to John, and I was grateful for him to share a few minutes with us. And as you heard his response, there are many sides of that coin. Uh, being reliant on other people for your support. Uh, but in the long run, it ends up being a positive thing. And God uses it to not only bless the giver and the receiver, but to bring joy in hard times. And that's exactly what the people that support John and his ministry do, and just like the Philippians did for Paul. So that's why he is so grateful in his let message to them, especially at the end. You know, there's a, an interesting little twist towards the middle of this passage that we just read in verse 17 and 18. You know, he, he acknowledges that his needs have been met by the church at Philippi, and he's grateful for that. But he also says not, it's not about just about him. It's also about them, and he uses a weird term. It's an accounting term. He says, I want it to be credited to your account, these works that you've done for me. And that seems a little odd, um, to me anyway, to have really an accounting term, that like their ledger will be full, that they're always gonna have enough as a result of the fact that they've been giving of themselves and supporting Paul. Now the people at the church at Philippi were not wealthy, but they were very generous with their gifts for, uh, for Paul. They, he always says all of his needs were met, uh, sometimes even in abundance. So that opportunity that the church at Philippi had with Paul is the same opportunity we have to invest in people that we see in need, whether they directly ask us for support, whether we just notice it and are moved to do it. But it is that whole package that God and his divine wisdom gives us the privilege of investing in the lives of other people. And I know the many times with students that I try to provide opportunities for them to serve other people, there has never been a time when those acts of compassion and support and investing in other people and trying to meet their needs, that it has always come back to those students and to everyone that participates. I, my family, uh, since my boys were very young, we've always sponsored a compassion child. Um, and we're on our third one. We've actually graduated two of them through high school, and once they are beyond high school age, uh, they move out of the program, so we've, we, uh, we get a new one. And our current child is from Kenya, uh, and his name is Pius, and he just turned 12. And two years ago, um, I had the privilege to go to Kenya uh, with, actually with the Moore Ministries, uh, in a preliminary uh, seeking ministry uh, in the Maasai villages in Kenya. And I took that opportunity, once I was there, to set up the opportunity to go meet Pius in his village and meet him at the school that he goes to. And the house that he lives in and the school that he goes to, he's able to live there and go to that school because of the financial support that my family sends through Compassion International to him. And it's hard to describe 
what that opportunity was like and how powerful it was for me. He, he at the beginning of our interaction, there was a third party there to help him with the language barrier and help me with his language barrier. And that person did most of the talking. Um, and then as we, we warmed up and we went for a walk, uh, Pius started opening up more and telling me what his desires are. And, uh, but about every other line of his conversation with me, oh, and I want to thank you so much for your support and what it's enabled me to do. And it was almost, I felt guilty because of how good it made me feel to see the successful young man that he was becoming. And it was something as simple as us committing as a family to support someone that we had never seen before uh, and we had very little contact with except for letters. It's that, that way God does things, that if we're willing to invest in the life of somebody else, if we're willing to support them, to see their needs and to try to meet them, he brings it full circle and offers such a joy that's hard for us to explain. The act of investing in another life and supporting others is a privilege that God gives us but calls us to. If you're going to take one thing away from today's message, I hope that it would be that you would look courageously into the lives of other people, that you would seek out people that have needs that are in dark places, and without your support, they may not make it. They may not have their needs met. If you have those opportunities and you have the means to meet those needs, I hope that you'll take that challenge and that privilege. And as you do so, I know from experience and from God's word and from the example of Paul, that God will bring incredible joy, not only to the life of the people that you're investing in and helping, but he will bring joy to your life as well. Now it's time to take this morning's offering. And I would just like to say this, that the offering is a very important part of worship. It's our opportunity to give back to God just a little bit of what he has given us and to give with gratitude and with joy. So let's do that now. Let's give back to God just a portion of what he has so graciously and generously given us. Our greatest need as human beings is to know that we are loved and not with a human kind of love, but a love that comes from God that loves us uh, regardless of what we do or what we don't do. That kind of love is another word for grace. And this table is a table of grace. Jesus invites us to come and to partake of this meal and somehow in the mystery of what God does, we experience the love of God. I've heard it said once that the sacraments, the bap baptism and the, the Lord's Supper are the hugs of God. So I wanna invite you today, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, that uh, I wanna invite you to this table to experience the hug of God. Let's join together now in the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. And let us now come into a time of prayer. Holy God, it is our great privilege and honor to be here today, to be with you, to be with one another wherever we happen to be physically. And so with the entire company of angels and saints in heaven and on earth, we do worship and glorify you, God most holy, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your splendor. All glory be to you, O Lord most high. And Lord most high, come to be with us 
right now, in this everyday low place, in our lives, wherever we are, that we might be fed by your grace, by your mercy, by your healing touch, by your power to go out into the world and to the rest of our lives to be the body of Jesus Christ, to be his eyes and ears and heart and arms to hug and legs to move to help one another. Holy God, by your Holy Spirit, transform these ordinary elements of the fruit of the vine and the fruit of the field into the body and blood of Christ alive for us in this place and in every place. And be with us now as we pray together the words that our Lord has taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, on the night in, on which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he turned to his disciples, his friends. And he said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Whenever you do this, remember me. So friends, I now want to encourage you to go ahead and take a piece of bread or tortilla or whatever it is you are using today and go ahead and uh, partake of this bread. In the same way, after supper, our Lord Jesus Christ took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant of grace sealed in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of all sin. Whenever you drink it, remember me. So friends, every time you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And now as we do each time we celebrate and gather for the Lord's Supper here at Piedmont Community Church, I invite you now to read or to recite the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, as we end our time together, I hope that you will Go in the knowledge and the promise that God loves you, that he has grace and mercy for you and everything that you do. And go in the confidence that he will use us to meet the needs of others if we are courageous and generous enough and desiring to invest in the lives of others. And in doing so, he will provide a joy for us that is unexplainable. Amen. Amen.